Professor Lakshmiwala obtained her doctoral degree in theoretical high energy physics from Madras University in 1984. She was initially a postdoctoral fellow and later a faculty member in the Department of Physics, IIT Madras, since 1991. She has diverse research interests ranging from topics in high energy physics, dynamical systems and chaos, quantum optics and quantum dynamics. She has carried out active research in all these areas and guided PhD scholars, undergrad and postgraduate students and several project students in diverse topics. She has published several research papers, articles, conference proceedings and a book on non-classical effects published by Springer Nature and given invited talks in national and international conferences. Uh, her NPTEL lectures, which comprise 41 video lectures on quantum mechanics, are well received across the world. And she has been the resource person for lecture series in several SCRC schools, UGC refresher programs, universities and workshops organized by the three Indian academies for many years till date. In today's talk, she will address some of the lessons that she can that can be learned from the optical tomogram in terms of effects such as bipartite entanglement, the extent of squeezing of the state and wave particle revivals during the temporal evolution of the quantum system. Uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Lakshmi Bala. So I'm very happy to be here and I'm happy that I've got a, an invitation to be here for a very good reason. As uh, she read out, I have uh, exploited my academic freedom quite a bit and I have moved through diverse areas. Um, I worked on essentially what I felt like working on at that time and uh, then moved on to something else which I thought I wanted to learn. And um, going through a diverse set of uh, areas in physics, uh, theoretical physics, has helped me build a toolbox um, which has worked well for me because uh, I'm able to relate to people from different uh, research communities. Um, uh, it is good that I started with high energy physics and I am where I am now because uh, now is the time when in this subject there are people from industry, uh, academia, experimenters and theoreticians, all of them in one forum. To me that is very exciting. Um, if I had gone from here to high energy physics, I would have definitely missed this. I think. Uh, this kind of integration between industry and academics is something that uh, I find very enchanting and I think uh, will have very good effects for the society and otherwise. Um, I wish to talk about what we can learn from quantum tomograms and I wish to start with something um, which puts us all on the same footing as Schrodinger. Schrodinger made no secret of his intention to substitute simple classical pictures for the strange conceptions of quantum mechanics for whose abstract character he expressed deep aversion. So I find that the deep aversion still continues with many of my students as well. And uh, then one asks, how much of classical physics, which people seem to like, can be pushed into understanding the quantum world? Where will we see the differences? And what are the differences? How bad are they? So it is in this sense that I wish to look at uh, uh, these uh, tomograms. Uh, my talk will be somewhat schizophrenic because in parts it will be rather pedagogical and uh, there'll be pretty pictures and you will like it. And then in parts it just gets technical, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, first of all, there are different approaches to understanding, oh my goodness, there are different approaches to understanding the uh, quantum classical divide. Some effects like squeezing, they have no classical analogs. But then there are some effects such as wave packet revivals, and I'll tell you what they are, which have classical parallels. The classical parallels would be the classical Talbot effect. Now some effects such as entanglement, you can create it using electromagnetic waves without invoking the concept of the photons. Uh, you could entangle orbital angular momentum modes and the polarization modes and so on. So how grey is this quantum classical divide? That's a good question to ask. And uh, what does it teach you? Now an ideal framework for investigating the classical quantum links, their differences, etc. is optics. You see, 
probability theory is extensively used in classical settings. All of us know about probability in classical physics. We also know that quantum mechanics is inherently probabilistic. So, can we push tools from classical probability theory into quantum physics? And what does it give us? It gives us a lot. After all, if we can transport medical imaging techniques, imaging techniques in general, which is done in a classical context, into the quantum framework, there is a lot that we can learn. And a tomogram, in a crude sense, is simply an imaging technique. So, suppose we identify a probability distribution, or a collection of probability distributions, which I will call the tomogram, and attempt to understand different states of light, we should be able to see differences between the classical and the quantum approach. Of course, if you follow the dynamical evolution of observables using tools of classical physics, you could see differences between classical and quantum dynamics. I will not worry about this aspect today, but I will just talk about this. So, the question is, what is a tomogram? Data available from measurements are binned into histograms. And if you do these measurements, if they are pertaining to light, they provide the optical tomograms. So, essentially, it's like a medical scan or imaging. At different angles, an output image is obtained. Each image is a slice of the full tomogram. Each image, therefore, carries partial information about the object. Now, the full state of the system, the wave function, as you call it, is to be reconstructed from the tomogram. That means you must use the set of all slices or images. It could be in classical optics. It could be in quantum optics, where we treat light as photons. Now, in practice, only a finite number of slices can be obtained. Now, in principle, we may need an infinite number of slices to reconstruct the object. But look at it from the point of view of a scan. The scan is done in different slices. And what is the optimum number of slices? Well, it depends on the problem. So, what is the optimal number of slices needed to reconstruct the object? So, in physics, this is the area of state reconstruction from the tomogram. The number of slices that you need depends on the system. But can there be any favored set of slices? In physics, for instance, could these slices correspond to canonically conjugate objects like position and momentum? Can we avoid detailed reconstruction of the object and infer its properties from a finite set of images. I will call this the tomographic approach. Now, you do that in a medical scan, where even qualitative features and changes compared to a reference scan become important. So, how far can you push this idea? Pretty far, as it turns out. And why would I want to push this idea? Because if I have experimental data, from which I make this quadrature histogram, that gives me the optical tomogram, I can do one of two things. I can do a quantum state reconstruction and get what is called the Wigner function or the state of the system, the wave function of the system, if you wish. This is a statistical procedure. It is inherently error prone and it becomes worse and worse as the number of components increase, as the dimensions of the Hilbert space increases. You will have this problem even with spins and qubits. After all, if Google wants to play with 74 qubits and somebody else wants to play with 125 qubits, reconstructing the state is not an easy matter. So, quantum state reconstruction from the scan or the tomogram is not easy. And it is, uh, it, it needs a lot of machine learning tools and so on, and that is still in its infancy. So, why not just read off as much as possible from the tomogram? So, let me start with the first thing that you can look at. Uh, suppose, as reference, I look at the Talbot effect in classical optics, where monochromatic light falls on a Ronchi grating laterally across the grating. What you will see is, at integer values of a certain distance, which is called the Talbot distance, a self-image of the grating is formed. So, light falls on the grating, and suppose the grating is like this. On this direction, at integer values, a self-image of the grating is formed. At half the Talbot distance, an image of two identical gratings superposed on each other with a small lateral shift is seen. At one-third the Talbot distance, you should, in principle, see three copies of the grating, and so on. The reason is interference of light passing through various rules of the grating. Many uh, institutions have this as an experiment. We have it in IIT Madras for our MSc students. Now, is there a quantum analog? Yes. 
The quantum analog is the revivals or recurrences of a quantum wave packet which passes through a nonlinear medium. Example, light passing through a nonlinear atomic medium. So what happens? What is this revival? The return of the initial wave packet to its original form apart from an overall phase at integer multiples of the revival time t rev. What happened at distances in the classical Talbot effect now happens at times, at a fundamental time t rev, twice t rev, thrice t rev and so on. Analogous of the fractional Talbot effect we have at um, a two sub packet fractional revival or two bonsai versions of the original at t rev by 2 at one third of the revival time you have a three sub packet fractional revivals and so on. Uh, difficult to see in an experiment but certainly you can go up to one or two Talbot distances. And there is a nice article, a very uh, detailed physics reports and there is a pedagogical article by Berry and uh, his collaborators and I would urge the students to read this. It's a very followable article. So here is a picture of Talbot. It's Henry Fox Talbot and uh, the person who was responsible for the Talbot effect. Um, something about him. Talbot invented photography independent of Dagger. There is a Fox Talbot Museum in uh, England. The results of his work was presented by him in a British Association meeting. Uh, he was a parliamentarian, a landowner, a photographer and so on. And uh, the Talbot effect was rediscovered by Lord Raleigh in 1881. Um, he used red light, for instance, and the grating had this. The Talbot distance was this. This is a classical effect. There is also a quantum Talbot effect. I'm not going to talk about that. So here is a student uh, presently in RRI uh, working for his PhD, Akhil, who worked with me in the lab. And uh, this is a numerically simulated Talbot carpet. You see, this is the grating and light falls on it. and uh, you see the original pattern here uh, at the Talbot distance. Uh, at half Talbot distance, you see this. Then at one third Talbot distance, you see this. This is the simulated thing, the Talbot carpet. This is what we got experimentally, but still not too bad because this kind of shows up there. And at half Talbot di distance, you see this and so on. Now we were working with something quite rickety. Now for uh, anybody who does not know, uh, a lot of carryover from the harmonic oscillator problem goes into uh, understanding electromagnetic fields and their quantum particles, the photon. Uh, the Hamiltonian for the oscillator is x squared plus p squared if you strip it off the constants and things. And here you know that the energy is e squared plus b squared. So this quadratic form helps me map the mathematics of the oscillator completely into the electromagnetic case. And where I have raising and lowering operators A and A dagger for the oscillator, which takes me from one energy level to the other, here I will have the same algebra, but I will interpret it as the photon creation and destruction operators. And A dagger A is the photon number operator. Not to worry about these things. I needed to say this because what is it that I measure? I need these objects, which are combinations of A and A dagger. This is like the harmonic oscillator position. This is like the harmonic oscillator momentum. But in optics, there is neither position nor momentum. This would be like the electromagnetic field and electric field, and that would be like the magnetic field. And we talk of field quadratures. The maths is the same. The interpretation is different. So there are lots of states of light. There is a standard coherent state. In a scan, you have a reference scan, you see. Like that here, normally we use coherent light, this laser light if you wish, ideal laser light as the reference state. And it's a combination, it's actually an infinite superposition of the zero photon state, one photon state, two photon state and so on. You can see the summation all the way to infinity. It has some very nice properties. And uh, if you measure its variance, um, the variance in the x quadrature and the p quadrature is half. And you say that light is squeezed either in x or in p if the variance is less than half. So the coherent state defines a whole lot of things for you. That's my reference scan. So if you take this combination of the zero photon and the one photon state, it's an example of squeezed light, which they use all the time in gravitational waves. They keep working with squeezed light. 
there are many non-classical states of light. You can add a photon to the coherent state systematically. So that helps you uh, talk of departure from coherence and all that. I don't think I'll need it, except to remember that I could work with these photon-added coherent states. So what is a tomogram? This is the operator. And what I do is basically measure this value of x at various angles theta. That's all that I do. When theta is 0, I just have x, the x quadrature. When theta is pi by 2, I have the p quadrature. Imagine going in the xp plane and taking measurements at various theta values. You're doing precisely a scan, nothing more. So here is a tomogram. A tomogram, what you do is you plot x theta on this axis and theta on that axis. I could have stopped with pi because from 0 to pi by 2, I go from position to momentum quadratures. From pi by 2 to pi, I get back to the position quadrature. I've done this to show the symmetry. This is coherent light. This is the tomogram of laser light, ideal laser light. If I reconstruct the, the state, I would get something like this. It's called a Wigner function. This is the optical tomogram for a superposition of two coherent, a definite superposition of two coherent states of light. This is the optical tomogram for a different superposition of two coherent states of light. And since quantum mechanics also has superposition as an important ingredient, understanding these tomograms become very important. But there are tomograms and tomograms. So what we need to do is this. From the tomogram, it is possible to compute all variances. And squeezing is defined in terms of variances. So it is possible to directly compute the extent of squeezing of that state of light at different angles. That possibility is there. That is one non-classical effect, because squeezing does not have a classical analog. And I do not need to reconstruct the state to understand what is the extent of squeezing. I can do it right from here. Then what about revivals? As I said, you start with an initial wave packet. It goes through a nonlinear Hamiltonian. And at T rev, the overlap between the initial and the final, if I mod squared, that's approximately one for a near revival, which is what happens in real life. Exactly one for a full revival. That's hard to see. And fractional revivals occur under certain conditions. Uh, so, let me look at the system for you. Here we go. You start with the coherent state of light. This is the tomogram. You pass it through a Kerr medium, a nonlinear optical medium, which is well defined by this Hamiltonian. Remember that A and A dagger are photon annihilation and creation operators. At time T rev by 2, where you are supposed to see a 2 sub packet fractional revival. You see the two strands. At three revival, at a time t rev by three, where you're supposed to see a three sub packet fractional revival. There you go, that's three strands. A t rev by four, where you're supposed to see a four sub packet fractional revivals. You can decipher this, there are four strands. So, right from the tomogram, I'm able to qualitatively see if there is a revival or a fractional revival, provided I work with a generic nonlinear medium. What else can I capture? Now, if I'm close to a revival or a fractional revival, I can see qualitative changes in the tomogram. For that same system, this is exactly at a two sub packet fractional revival. A little bit before and a little bit after, you can see the qualitative change. Of course, if I went through the process of reconstruction of the state, this is the corresponding Wigner function. This is the corresponding Wigner function, and that is the corresponding Wigner function. I do not have to do so much work. I just see it here. Now, suppose I want to look at entanglement. I need at least two systems. So I need to define two sets of quadrature operators. So there is an A and an A dagger, which are the photon destruction and creation operators for the first um, source, and B and B dagger for the second source. And these photons could get entangled. Now the tomogram is going to be a function of theta 1, x theta 1, theta 2, and x theta 2. This is a two-mode state tomogram. 
I have a way of reducing it by doing suitable tracing and getting the single mode tomograms as well. If I want to study entanglement, like, like Urvashi pointed out, the whole is not a sum of the parts. So if I want to understand entanglement, I need to know something about the whole. I need to know something about the parts. So I will reduce the tomogram and look at the parts. I will look at the whole and get some idea about it. And then I'll give you some ideas from the tomogram as to how to estimate entanglement. That is the purpose. Yeah. So now if you look at the double well BEC model, here too if you look at a thing like revivals, you will see this in a double well Bose Einstein condensate, four sub packet, three sub packet, two sub packet, and a single packet. I could do this kind of entanglement in an atom field interaction model, which is what is pictorially depicted here. This is an example where the entanglement dips at certain times. It, 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 it's uh, half time, one third time, and so on. And if you look at the qualitative changes, for an initial coherent state, it is this. At half time, it's pronouncedly different from here. It. If you started with an initial Fox state, it is this. If you started with an initial coherent state, it is that. Quantum entanglement indicators can be defined, as I said, using properties from the whole and the part. We have done that, and that's very mathematical. So I will not get into that. But it takes off inspired from classical probability theory. And now one wants to see how good they are. Well, they are good. Because if I make an experiment in the IBM platform, which we have done, where we look at a two-level atom interacting with light, <clears throat> the two levels of the atom form a qubit. And since one photon is either absorbed or removed, that's another qubit for me. And if I look at two two-level atoms and two radiation fields, and the atoms initially entangled and so on, the extent of entanglement at sample instance can be done. We put it through the IBM uh, platform, did the experiment in the superconducting qubit atmosphere, did a numerical simulation, and then when we compared, uh, this is uh, what you get from the simulation, this is what you get from the optics calculation. This is from the experiment, and not surprising, because we didn't put in decoherence and experimental losses here, so they agreed. And this is the effect of decoherence and experimental losses. There is another experiment. Uh, two photon entangled states were used by these uh, authors. They are frequency combs with finite width peaks. And they were identified experimentally and distinguished using an interferometric setup. We have used a tomographic slice, a time time slice, and this is the tomogram for one of the entangled pair, and this is the tomogram for the other entangled pair. Easy. You can just see the difference. We've also worked with NMR experiments and the NMR data where we have worked with spin tomograms and shown that these entanglement indicators work well. I will not go through that today because I'm talking about optical tomograms. Many things can be done, including trying to figure out bifurcation cascades because of uh, changes in the intensity dependence of the uh, system and so on. And actually, you see a bifurcation cascade in this system. This is a lambda atom interacting with two fields. And that has been captured in the tomograms. So here we go. This is the change. You see, sudden changes in the qualitative features. The entanglement indicators are useful for quantitatively capturing the extent of entanglement. So we can do both qualitative and quantitative things. Um, this is an entanglement indicator which captures those changes very nicely, very nicely. Where it dips, there is a change in the entanglement. Quantum synchronization, again, can be captured. I need not go through this uh, because by now you know there is a change between this and these two. This is where the synchronization happens. The corresponding Wigner function looks like this compared to these two. So I summarize. This is an alternative prescription for circumventing messy, cumbersome, and error-prone state reconstruction in the lab. It's particularly useful for systems with large Hilbert spaces, as happens in quantum optics, arrays of spin systems, and hybrid quantum systems. The important question is 
Can you quantify entanglement beyond the bipartite system? Can you look at decoherence losses better with tomograms? What is the ultimate aim? The ultimate aim is to obviate the necessity for detailed state reconstruction for these purposes, particularly in multipartite systems. Do I have a minute? I have a minute. Okay. This is what I have to say about the technical part of it. I just want to make an appeal to you. Uh, having seen many students in my career, <clears throat> and as many of my colleagues have also remarked, we come across many students, boys and girls, who at a critical period, um, you know, right after their MSc, who would like to pursue certain dreams, cannot do it because of uh, financial constraints or ill health at home or whatever, other family issues. Um, most times I find that they come back after 10 years saying, yeah, I wanted to do it, but I could not do it. Uh, please pursue your dreams. Because 10 years later, you might be able to achieve it in a different avatar. So please keep an open mind. And don't just shut off your dreams because at some point in your life, uh, you know, your family situations caught on and you could not carry on. Please remember that for every person educated here and who have had certain uh, um, lucky advantages, there are people out there who have not had your kind of education. So I think you owe it to yourself and to a society to pursue your dreams and try to move up in your career in spite of the fact that as ladies, you might have many problems in your families now and then. So that's just an appeal. Thank you very much. So I'm interested in that Talbo carpet. I'm also interested in it. <laughs> I'm sure you are. So um, it's actually a physical system because the neck the, the second picture was, so I'm interested to know the material or how you... The grating that we used in the lab? Oh, we took a transparency slide and drew on it with rules. And that is precisely why you got such a primitive no, picture. But why is it called a carpet? Because of the... Because it looks like a carpet. It's beautiful. It's like an interwoven yeah, carpet. Uh, so Berry called it quantum carpets, carpets of light. So uh, the patterns are very geometrical, very repetitive. Mm -hmm. and very predictable. So, that's why. Ah, this carpet is in this plane. The grating is like this. The carpet is on the floor always. So the carpet, the grating is in the, uh, along the y-axis. The x, the y, the carpet is in the exit.